thanks for coming. This is uh, this is the first time that I've really read from the book. It's the first time I've seen the book tonight, and it's good weight. I feel like it's a good weight. Um, <laughs> I uh, I feel like I should say something about the book because it. Uh, my 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 big feeling is that it's my main feeling is that I'm going to talk for ten minutes and then they're going to take me off before I even read. But the um, <laughs> the the, uh, the big thing is that it's 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 the kind of a book that um, builds on all the coincidences coincidences and links between the sections, so that reading any one part is probably not going to give you a great idea of what's going on. I, um, when I published my first book in 2003, I was being confused a lot uh, online, um, especially on Amazon, uh, with another Chris Eaton, who was writing uh, books on how to do short-term missionary work. <laughs> um, and so if you liked The Inactivist, you might also like how Jesus might affect your life, <laughs> things like that. Um, and so it 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 uh, it was interesting, and I and I, I at first I was a little bit put off by it, and then I was kind of excited by the idea of people reading that other book and then coming to mine, uh, or vice versa. And um, I I got really obsessed with this guy who is really fascinating because he. Uh, ran for office like a million times in Florida as a Republican, as a Democrat, as an independent. Um, he lost every time. Uh, there were like transcripts of, um, of some of his debates, uh, one of which I put in the book. I can't think of how it works now, but it's, it's, he's got this amazing one-liner back at this other guy who won. Um, but it's, it was a, a process of, of getting obsessed with him and then, and then moving on to all the other people because I felt like all of them had something in common with me. And so it started off as just as an obsession of, uh, of like, um, I, I, I try to describe this book as being like, uh, uh, formulating a conspiracy theory that you're like, oh yeah, look at that guy. He played tennis. And when I was 12, I played tennis once. <laughs> so we have this connection. And then there's like five guys who were all from St. Petersburg, but one's in St. Petersburg, Florida, and one's in Russia, and one's... And so there's all these weird, like, Chris Eaton links that I grouped together to try to form a life from all of their real events. Um, and uh, there were a couple of guys. I, I, I kind of picked this uh, section kind of half at random but there was um there were a couple of guys who 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 fought with uh, the American military and I've I've got them based in here uh, so they were uh, um both in in the first Iraq war and the second one as well and uh I uh yeah I'm just going to read this bit this is this is, this is this is there's a soldier who goes off and he's assigned to latrine duty and so his job is to dig um, toilets, just dig pits to put shit in. But then everybody gets dysentery from eating kebabs, and then they um, he he has to burn it all. But then he um, he doesn't get any problems, um, and so he makes fun of everybody. And so then they they like convince him to drink this drink before he goes off to like the real battle and they put epicac in it and he um he's sort of hanging off the back of the off the back of the personnel carrier if that's the right term um sort of like hanging out um and then he everyone falls asleep because it's a long drive and he's worried he's going to have diarrhea in the back and there's another guy who's got headphones on and he can start all of a sudden hearing the headphones going, and uh, he so he looks at this guy, thinking like, "Is that where the sound is coming from?" And the other guy looks at him, and he's like, "Oh crap!" This, and I have to talk to this guy because <laughs> we both met eyes. And this is the section from that. The other soldier asked him if he liked music, 
Chris Eaton said he did. The other soldier asked what kind, and Chris Eaton said all kinds. Was there not any one kind in particular? asked the other soldier. And Chris Eaton said no, there was not. What about country? asked the other soldier. What about rock? What about Christian music? There's a very famous, <laughs> very famous uh, Chris Eaton who writes Christian rock music. He's won Grammys and stuff. You may know, I don't remember the name of the song, um, but he wrote a song for Amy Grant. Does anybody remember Amy Grant? He wrote a lot of songs for Amy Grant. One of those won a Grammy. <laughs> Um, so what about Christian music? Him? He liked only one band. That was how particular his taste was. And probably when it came right down to it, just one album. It was his album, he said. It was the album he'd probably been searching for most of his life and didn't even know it. And when he finally found it, nothing else he listened to felt complete. It was the album that finally made him feel calm. It was the album, he felt, that might have saved his marriage, if he'd found it sooner, that might have saved the relationship with his kids. It was the album that might have made him happy. Chris Eaton reconfirmed that he liked all kinds of music, that he found them all interesting and appealing for a variety of reasons, and that he tried whenever he could to venture outside of his normal comfort zone to seek out new auditory experiences. The other soldier suggested Chris Eaton had just not found the right one yet. <laughs> the other soldier asked him if he'd killed anyone yet. The other soldier said, the one thing worse than lobsters on your piano was crabs on your organ. <laughs> it's the best joke ever. Aside from what's brown and sticky. Do you guys know that one? No, a stick. It's, great. it's the best joke ever. <laughs> the, other, the other soldier said he had once read an article in a magazine written by a man, he said, or maybe a woman from a part of the country where you wouldn't expect, where they don't normally have those kinds of people, people who don't have anything to do with their hands, people who think too much, not in some place like New York or Massachusetts or Rhode Island or California. No, this person was from somewhere in the middle. And this was where he'd first come across the idea that each person had one album that was their musical soulmate. The premise, he said, was really not an expansion on the idea of, of uh, was it really just an expansion on the idea of des Desert Island Discs, a, ra a radio program started in Britain shortly after the outbreak of World War II, when the creator, Roy Plom Plomley, was searching for some sort of an entertainment-based distraction to raise national spirits. Or rather, a tighter focus on the idea, which had invited celebrities as varied as the Welsh singer and radio host, I don't know how to pronounce Welsh names really, but Tom Pui, <laughs> um, <laughs> painter <laughs> Schiller D, I don't know, poet Fernando Kian, and Italian sex symbol Elisabetta Cinque, which are all just, um, I, I made them all up, but they're all uh, in the different languages. Their last names are who? <laughs> um, to select their top eight records. There's a lot of weird, there's a lot of just weird, uh, I, I can't seem to write stuff unless I have these things that, um, these games for myself that no one will ever get. Yes, it's a bad thing. Um, so their top eight record, eight, eight records and one luxury item they could never do without. I sh sorry, I should thank Jay and Hazel <laughs> before I go any further um, <laughs> for uh, even making this in the first place and 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 convincing people that they should read it and. Uh, and Mark for designing it and putting up with me when I was like, eh, I don't know about that font. Can we put another font in there? Can we do like double bold on that bit? It's amazing, Mark, you were right. Um, uh, so yeah, back to the story. To select uh, their top eight uh, records and one luxury item they could never do without. 
most people tended to choose Ode to Joy. And this is this is all like kind of you know if you went and looked back at uh, Desert Island Disc, you'd find there's a lot of people who choose Ode to Joy because it's really safe. You can be like, oh, I like classical music. Um, so you know, to not appear too lowbrow, rather than choosing something as bass and popular as In Der Führer's Face, which was a big popular song at the time, or Marzi Dotes, you know that one. That's a great joke, too. Marzy dotes and dozy dotes. And little lambsy divey. I always thought that I, I actually, it, it took me until I was probably in my early 30s to realize that those were real words and not just na nonsense sounds. Um, or we're going to hang out the, the washing on the Siegfried line was a big hit at the time. Um, but the first few guests are most notable for interesting selections, like Louis Jordan's uh, Swimming with the Fishes, or Chip Shorter's The Blackout Stroll, or Louis Armstrong's experimental jazz number, a, prefer a prevaricated horn shot. Um, there's a lot of... Uh, I, I, I did a lot with um, anagrams of my name, so a prevaricated horn shot is just a Christopher Eaton, I think. Um, selected by uh, Schuller Dye, who, again, is somebody I made up, in which the middle trumpet solo is actually just Armstrong trying to mimic the sound of his instrument with his lips. Pui, for his luxury item, chose a bottomless bottle of Dalwini, and the American critic from the magazine he'd read had taken this premise one step further, suggesting people might be happy, happier even, with just one album because this would remove the stress of having to choose between those eight every day. And the critic used, as an example, the life of someone the soldier was unfamiliar with, someone he had meant to look up, but as of yet had not. In fact, he'd all but forgotten his name. Because the most interesting thing about this person, this happiest man, was not his name, but how he had started his own musical journey through life and how it seemed to mirror the other soldier's life so precisely, listening to his parents' old jazz records uh, on the wrong speed, which was this thing I did when I was a kid. Um, they, uh, they, I have these two main memories of music as a kid, and one of them is that this friend came over and was like, Elvis died. <laughs> and she was crying so hard, and I was like, oh my God, it was Elvis. Because <laughs> um, I was six or something, and I had no idea. And I don't think she even cared about Elvis before that, but it was like this, you know, important event. And the other thing was this record that my sister and I used to live, listen to all the time um, by the... Oh, I'm gonna screw it up, but the I think it's the Andrews sisters. The Andrews sisters sound like they're way bigger than this, but it was it was the Something Sisters, um, and they had this album. They they had a lot of albums, but they had a song called Banana Split, um, that I still know all the lyrics to, even though this is something we listened to when I was six. Um, and we didn't know how to use a record player, so we didn't realize that a 45 was on a different speed than, a, than an LP. So we would put these 45s on, and there'd be this like trio of sisters singing this song, but it'd be like, Banana Split. <laughs> and it was the best. We thought it was the best song in the whole wide world. And I did an interview a couple of years ago um, you know, the, uh, I, I played in a band for a while and there was this, um, somebody interviewed us and they asked me about my formative music and I described this song to them and the person found this song, which I had never been able to find, and s slowed it down digitally and then put it on as an MP3 on their website. So I've been able to hear it since and it's it's amazing. It just sounds like a bunch of old, like, fat guys. just like, banana split. Yum, yum, yum. Anyways, that, that's in here somewhere. <laughs> um, so listening to his old uh, parents' jazz records on the wrong speed, thinking music was a plodding thing, heavy and thick like gobs of batter falling from a spoon. Being introduced to the music of Charlie Harden, which broke everything wide open, obviously owing a note to Elvis, but without the king's fattening showmanship, uh, 
purchasing everything Harden, every Harden record he could find from what he thought was Harden's self-titled debut, a common mistake and not made just by the two of them, to the third album, The Grey Fog. I don't even know what that reference is anymore. They, um, I, my other big memory of, of music as a kid was I was really into um, Buddy Holly, and then I found an album by the Hollies, and I was like, oh, great, his whole band got together, <laughs> and they made an album, and then I went out and bought like eight vinyl copies of Holly's records, which you wouldn't think there'd be that many even, but I bought them all, and then I would, I, I suddenly realized, like, oh, yeah, that's the guy in The, the Day the Music Died, <laughs> um, who died, so it wasn't him. Um, uh, so even after the singer-guitarist died so prematurely and they continued to release greatest hits packages with smatterings of unreleased studio recordings for the next 10 years, this led to the discovery of the British Invasion, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, through an honest, hopeful mistake, a record by a band called The Hardens, this is what I was talking about too early, who had no real connection to Charlie and were not particularly good. The other man went to Vietnam, too, and opened up a music store, and the soldier began to believe that the article had actually been written about him specifically. He thought it was a sign, and he began weeding down his own collection, as if by a message from God, immediately tossing any record he had not listened to in the last five years. Then one year then six months, then writing down very selective criteria that had to be met by the remaining hundred or so records to stay on this shelf. That it had to be influential in some way and couldn't be simple to classify as a genre and had to be somewhat obscure because he didn't want his special disc, his one disc that he could choose, to also possibly be someone else's disc without being entirely pompous. And then he basically just decided to remove the half dozen classical records because how could they really speak to him when they were, weren't from his generation? And anything with a saxophone <laughs> or a banjo. Until one day he was down to his traditional eight Desert Island discs, which he had set up head to head in a tournament bracket until he had one winner. And those eight records were The Doors, Narrative Chap, which is just another anagram of my name. Uh, 1978, one of the three post-Morrison albums, which is all the other soldier would listen to, because as far as he was concerned, there was only room for one Morrison on the list. Van Morrison, yeah. With an album cover that featured a photo of a private ranch, presumably uh, Jim Morrison's, that fit the title particularly well. Then there was Van Morrison, Veed and Fleece, which is my one album that I will only ever listen to from now on. Uh, Charlie Harden, self-titled. Chip Shorter, Rave on Data. Also a lesser known later work, uh, collaborating with a trio of young turntablists named Patri, Vitaro, and Hirsch. Uh, Stina Verda, Ch uh, Charo, which is a album that comes up a lot in, in the book. Um, uh, She's a young musician, kind of, I don't know, like, uh, who's that young Brazilian singer? You know what I'm talking about? Ch -ch -ch -ch. Not something like that? No? Anyway, but, based, but, but, but inspired by Charo, who was in all those, like, 80s. Um, yeah. Shakira, that's right. Shakira, and it's like, but also... Her album's called Charo, because Charo, who was like, Chicky Chicky, that guy, that one. Um, the Welsh guy who, can't, who I can't pronounce, uh, Hot Arsenic, Chet Nasario, Hardtop Rev, and Chris Eaton. She was a big freak, which is um, another album that comes up in the, album, in the book a lot. His luxury item, he decided, would be a book of crossword puzzles. And finally, he was left with only Charlie Harden and Chip Shorter, played for old times like time sake on the wrong speed and he chose chip shorter and he found that the result was the opposite that he was hungry hungrier for new music than he'd ever been in his life and the next day he heard music that was the last cd he'd ever buy the cd he was currently listening to and he'd never listened to another record again we're all searching for something the other soldier said i'm just lucky enough to have found it 
That's idiotic, Chris Eaton said, and he shut his eyes to go to sleep. And the next day, he was dead.